All right, it says we started broadcasting. Is it broadcasting? All right, it's live. All right. Praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Again, invoking the Father, fill me for this session to continue my refutation of the attacks against the Christian faith. And I ask the Father for clarity of thought and speech to anoint my mouth, my mind, my heart. Fill me with the Spirit. Anoint the sound of my voice to be pleasing to your ears. And enable me to speak truth clearly, recall scriptures, and interpret them correctly for the glory, honor, and majesty of the Lord Jesus, the Father's beloved. Father, have the Son, Jesus, increase in all of us. I pray Jesus will sit and throne upon our hearts. All of us, my wife, my daughters, all of us, and they were covered by the blood of the Lord Jesus, your beloved Son, and fill us. We love you, Father. We love your Son. We love your Spirit. Use me, Lord, please, and keep me holy, and heal us, Lord, for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. We can never praise God enough and never, never cry out to God enough because we completely depend on Him. We're now going to continue... My response to Paul Williams' appeal to 1 Chronicles 29 20 to show that David was worshipped alongside God as proof that human beings can be worshipped without being God. That's what he's trying to accomplish. 1 Chronicles 29 20. I hope this is going to bless you because you're going to see that Jesus is worshipped in the same way that God is worshipped. Okay? 1 Chronicles 29 20. We're going to have fun with this one. All right? Let's, let's look at it one more time to see. Even in that passage, if you pay attention carefully, there is a distinction, a differentiation between the way God is reverenced with David. Pay attention now. This is why we have to ask the Holy Spirit to open our minds to see clearly, to go into the depth of Scripture, the meat of Scripture. Read with me. And David said to all the congregation, Now bless, bless is another way of saying praise, Jehovah your God. And all the congregation blessed Jehovah God of their fathers and bowed down their heads and worshiped the Lord and the King, Jehovah the King. Even here you see a distinction of differentiation between the way God is honored and David is honored. Notice it's Jehovah who's blessed alone. They didn't bless Jehovah and David in this context. So God is blessed, praise, and the king is reverence alongside Jehovah, not because he's being worshipped as God. We agree. But because he's being reverenced, given honor as God's representative. That David is God's human king sitting on God's earthly throne representing God <clears throat> manifesting God's rule to Israel so they're reverencing him as God's human spokesperson human vehicle through which God speaks and manifests his rule to Israel so we agree he's not being worshipped as God per se but is this how Jesus is worshipped does Jesus receive reverence because he's simply God's spokesperson is human manifestation but not because he's God so that's what we're trying to answer number one Jesus isn't simply worship in other words he's not simply given what the Greek word would be proskeneo because don't forget you got to remember this light and everyone else Christian princes you have to remember this the Hebrew word used here is ishtichava from shakha okay when they translated this word worship in, in Greek, they translated it as proskuneo. Okay? Now let me show you where proskuneo is given to the Lord Jesus Christ. So you understand what I'm talking about. It's not so much that Jesus is given proskuneo. It's the kind of proskuneo he receives that shows he must be God. But let me show you where that word proskuneo for worship is given to the Lord. Let's go to Matthew 2.2. 2. I'll give you a few examples. Matthew 2.2. 2. Now let me know if you're following me. Let me know that my point is clear. You're not getting confused. Now here, the wise men from the east, the magi from the east, come to Herod. And they say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. The word is proskuneo. Now notice why are they worshiping him? Because he's the king of the Jews. Like David was. So here they'll tell you, see, Jesus is being worshipped not as God, but he's being shown reverence and honor like David for being king. You guys understand that? Light everyone else? You understand now? Now, now, seems like it's a good objection, right? Wow. Yeah, really. He's being given proskuneo, which not necessarily worship given to God, because he's a king of the Jews like David received proskuneo. 
So then why do I assume that Jesus is God because he receives proskuneo, but I don't assume that for David? That's the objection. Matthew 2, 8. Matthew 2, 8. Watch what happens here. And Herod says to the wise men, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child. And when he had found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. Proskuneo. Matthew 2, 11. Matthew 11. I'll just give you a few examples where proskuneo is used. And so to say that Jesus received worship is not a strong argument for anti-Trinitarians. Joe's witnesses and Muslims already know that people have received rel relative worship, proskuneo or shakha, without this making them God. Because here it doesn't mean worship given to God. It means honor, reverence. So that won't convince them that Jesus is being worshipped as God. So we're going to have to do a little better. Matthew 2, 11. And when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshipped him. This is the wise men again. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Interesting combination. As a side note, for those of you who want to know whether Jesus is being worshipped as God here, two things show that he's being worshipped as God here. That the Magi knew that this king of Israel was divine. And there are several factors that confirm that. Number one, don't forget that according to the ancient Near Eastern civilizations, they all believed that kings were divine beings, that their human kings were divine beings, sons of the gods. So in light of their background, it's not a stretch to assume they would have thought that this human king of Israel would have been divine, right? But more importantly, we don't appeal to the pagan backgrounds to prove that Jesus would have been worshipped as God. The Magi, the word Magi or Magoi, is used in the Greek version of the book of Daniel to refer to the astrologers who worked with Daniel and saw the great wisdom and knowledge that God had given Daniel, and they actually submitted to Daniel's authority, right? You read the Greek version of Daniel, this word Magoi, Magoi, Magois, is used of those astrologers, right? At the time of Daniel, who saw the wisdom knowledge that the true God had given him, a knowledge and wisdom that surpassed theirs, and they even appointed him to rule over them, right? So this would tell us that these magi from the east would have been spiritual descendants, not necessarily physical. Of the magi at the time of Daniel, the magi who were privy to the revelation that God gave Daniel of one like a son of man who would come, to rule over the nations and be worshipped the same way that God is worshipped. Daniel 7, 13 and 14. So if you take that into consideration, that means these magi would have known because of Daniel and that tradition preserved by their spiritual ancestors that a king would arise from the Jews, that son of man who would be worshipped as God. You with me there? So you can make a very powerful case that they knew this king was that God man that Daniel said would come, whom all nations would have to worship. Is it making sense to you guys or no? Now, I'm giving you a very quick overview of the evidence. Lord willing, I'm going to write an article in due time and do an entire session on this, right? But another sign that they're giving him worship as God is worshipped and not simply honoring him as a king. Let's look at Matthew 2, 11. One more time. As the Lord Jesus enables me to recall this information without error. For the glory of Christ. One more time. And when they were coming to the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother. So they saw the mother, right? And fell down and worshipped him. Right there, that tells me whatever worship they were giving him is a worship that would not be befitting to Mary, his mother. But if it was simply honor and reverence, why not honor and reverence his blessed mother? But notice... That this act of proskuneo is directed to him alone. If this proskuneo is no more, no more than honor and reverence, then we'd expect that the mother of the king would be honored and reverenced by virtue of being his mother, right? Wouldn't we expect that? But she's not given proskuneo because it would be unbefitting for her to receive it. Added to that, notice the gifts they give to him, not to them, to him. They give him gold. Well, that would be tribute to a king, right? 
But frankincense is kind of weird because frankincense is what you give in connection to the worship of God. And frankincense is what you give priests to offer in the temple. Why give it to him? Why give him frankincense? He's not a priest. They're not in a temple. Why give him frankincense? Isn't this an indication that this frankincense is given in recognition of the fact that he is God who is worthy of worship? Do you guys see it or no? Let me know you're seeing this if I'm confusing you. Why, are you catching this? And Christian princess, I want to make sure you're getting this. And then myrrh is what you use to prepare dead bodies for burial. Myrrh. So here you see a foreshadowing, or you see an indication that Christ is a king. He receives tribute. But he's also God, which is why incense is offered to him, which is a priestly act of worship, and myrrh in anticipation of his death. That's what you use myrrh for, right? To prepare bodies for burial. Hmm, interesting. All of this deliberately designed by God's Holy Spirit. But anyway, whole point is, someone will say, well, Jesus is being worshipped as a king, not worshipped as God. So it's not worship in the divine sense, but worship in the sense of reverence. That's the objection. Okay? That's the objection. How do we refute this objection? Very easily. Let's go to 1 Chronicles 29, 10 to 14. Let's see how David and Israel worship God. A worship not given to any human king, not even David. First Chronicles 29, 10 to 14. Where, wherefore, David blessed Jehovah the Lord before all the congregation. And David said, now pay attention to what he's going to say to Jehovah. Blessed be thou, Jehovah, God of Israel, our father, forever and ever. So you are blessed, glorified forever and ever. A doxology. Thine, O Jehovah, is the greatness. The greatness is yours. And the power, and the glory, and the victory, and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. So notice, everything in heaven and earth is yours. Right? Thine is the kingdom, O Jehovah, Lord. And thou art exalted as head above all. So he's exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come of thee. Riches and honor come from you. And thou reignest over all. And in thine hand is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But whom I... Whom I who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee and of thine own hand we gi we given thee. We're giving you what you gave, gave us. We're giving to you, back to you what you gave us. So notice who Jehovah is. He's the one to be blessed, praised forever and ever. Greatness is from him. Power is from him. Glory is from him. Victory is from him. So ascribe it all to him. To you, Jehovah, is greatness, power, glory, victory, and majesty. Everything in heaven and earth belongs to Jehovah. The kingdom is Jehovah's, right? He is exalted as head over, above all. Riches come from him. Honor come from him because he reigns over all. He's the one who strengthens you. He's the one who gives you power and strength, right? And you are to praise his name forever. Now I'm going to show you that everything that David just said about Jehovah is said about Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Are you ready? All this praise and accolade and all these functions and attributes given to Jesus Christ in the New Testament. Are you ready? To see it? <clears throat> Who's ready? Nobody's ready. Ooh, you guys are all asleep. Ooh, interesting. Ooh. Come on. Now I'm going to show you the way David worshipped Jehovah is the way the New Testament says Jesus is to be worshipped. All the power, all the glory, all the victory, strength belongs to Jehovah. He is to be praised and blessed forever and ever. His name is to be blessed forever. He reigns above all as the head of all, right? Everything in heaven and earth is his. Let's see if that language is ascribed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Where do riches and strength come from? 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Where do riches and strength come from? 2 Corinthians 8, 9. Watch here. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the unmerited favor of Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, made himself nothing, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Our riches come from the grace of Jesus Christ. David said it comes from Jehovah. Ephesians 3.8. Ephesians 3.8. Let me show you that Jesus is worshipped in the exact same way David worshipped Jehovah. And the same accolades 
attributes, functions that are ascribed to Jehovah by David are ascribed to Jesus. Notice Ephesians 3 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Oh, wow. We are rich because of Christ's riches. He impoverished himself so he can make us rich. And Christ's riches are unsearchable. He possesses infinite riches. Sure sounds like what David said about Jehovah, Paul says about Jesus. And strength comes from Jehovah, right? Power comes from Jehovah, right? 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Now you tell me what David said about Jehovah that's not said about Jesus. Okay? Guys, please pay attention. I hope this blows you away. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Strength comes from who? Who strengthens us? Who preserves us? Right? Okay. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. As the Lord gives me recall. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, lest I could become arrogant and puffed up, Paul is saying, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, something to prick me and keep me humble and show me how useless I am without Christ. The messenger of Satan to buffet me, an angel of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. Now watch here. Notice who he's going to pray to. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice. Three times I besought the Lord. Notice who the Lord is, guys. Please, you got to get this. You get it, you'll be blown away. That it might depart from me. And he, the Lord that he asked three times, said to, unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. For my strength, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Now watch who the Lord is, who gave Paul strength and grace to endure this attack of Satan. Most gladly, therefore, Will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me? Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and reproaches and necessities and persecutions in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, there am I strong. So who is the Lord that Paul prayed to three times? Who is the Lord who answered him and says, look, I'm going to give you my grace and my strength to endure it. It's Christ. Because notice what Paul says. The power of Christ may rest upon me. So power and strength to endure comes from who? According to this passage. Power and strength comes from who? According to this passage. Help me out. Who gives us power and strength to endure, to remain faithful? Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? Light, did you get it or no? Good. Then who is the Lord that he prayed to? And who's the Lord that answered him? Who's the Lord that he prayed to? And who's the Lord who answered him and said, Look, I'm going to give you my grace and my strength to endure it? Jesus, right? So you're telling me not only did Paul pray to Jesus, but Jesus answered that prayer and told Paul, I'm going to give you my power, my strength, my grace to preserve you. But that's exactly what David said about Jehovah. Jehovah prays to Jehovah. I'm sorry. David prays to Jehovah, blesses Jehovah, and thanks Jehovah. Saying that Jehovah, the power and strength we have is from you. The riches we have is from you. All of which Paul ascribed to Jesus. Jesus, it's your riches that makes us rich. It's your power and your strength that sustains us. Who does Paul think Jesus is? And why would he ascribe such accolades, such attributes, such functions to Christ? Why would he pray to Christ if Christ is no more than a human king like David was? Help me out. Come on. Let's see if you guys are awake. And yet Paul, so you're telling me Paul gave Jesus the same praise, glory, accolades, functions that David gave to Jehovah in 1 Chronicles 29, 10 to 14? Amram is getting it. You're getting it? Now, like, can I ask you a question? Because you come out of a background where you thought Jesus isn't God. Bible's corrupt. What's running in your mind to see this kind of description, these kind of attributes, functions ascribed to Jesus? And you were raised in a church and no one showed you this. Now that you're seeing it, what's running in your mind? What's running in your heart? And for the rest of you, share with me your thoughts because I really want to know. That's why I ask to make sure that you're getting it. And the Spirit is you know, just shocking you and rocking you with this evidence.
What's running in your mind? Man, you guys are gone or here? Oh, it's mind blowing. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Praise the Lord. That's exactly because you're dealing with a God who blows minds away. He's infinitely great, infinitely great, infinitely amazing. All right. For the rest of you, went to sleep like glory to thee and everyone else. Enjoy your nap, suckers. Now, let's come back. Let's come back now. We're still not done yet. Remember? Power, strength is from Jehovah. Riches is from Jehovah. We are rich because of Jehovah, right? And he is to be blessed. He is to be praised. And his name is to be praised forever and ever, right? Now, 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 16. Uh, good for you. I need to lose weight and you're working on it, huh, you wicked sinner? 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 16. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 16. Watch here. Notice what Paul's going to say again. 1 Timothy 1, 12 to 16. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. Why is he thanking someone in heaven other than God? Jesus is not on earth. Jesus is in heaven. And yet in his prayer, he's thanking Jesus, saying, thank you, Lord Jesus. So again, he's praying to Jesus. Now, why is he thanking Jesus? Watch, why? And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me. Also, it is Christ who empowers me. For that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. So Christ is the one who assigns the roles that you assume. I who was a blasphemer, former before a blasphemer, a persecutor, injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in belief. I didn't really know who Jesus was, so he showed mercy to me. And the grace of our Lord. So it's the grace of Jesus, the power of Jesus. That's why I'm thanking Jesus. Was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. So even this love and faith that I have, I have it from Jesus because of Jesus. So faith is from Jesus. Love is from Jesus. Strength is from Jesus, right? Grace is from Jesus. So I thank Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all accept acceptation. That Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy that in me, first Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, might show through me by saving me having mercy on me not destroying me jesus christ will use me as an example to show forth all long suffering how patient he is with sinners for pattern to them to give hope to those right which should hereafter believe on him to everlasting life life everlasting okay did you catch it here paul again prays to jesus thanks jesus because it's jesus who enabled him gave him power and strength to endure to do ministry, he assigned him ministry. He bestowed upon Paul his grace and mercy. So notice, grace, mercy, riches, power, strength, all come from Jesus to us. The very things David said about Jehovah, here the New Testament says about the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's see if Jesus is to be praised, blessed forever and ever. 2 Peter 3.18. 2 Peter 3.18. 2 Peter 3.18. But grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Okay, now I'm confused. David says, bless Jehovah your God forever and ever. Peter says, it is the Lord Jesus Christ whom we are to glorify both now and forever. Amen. You're telling me Jesus was given the same reverence that David received, but he wasn't being worshipped as God? You're telling me the New Testament saints... Did not worship Jesus as God in the same way that David worshipped Jehovah as God? That's what you're trying to convince me with First Chronicles 29.20? 20? Do you even know the Bible to even make that case? You ignore all these passages, really? But watch here. Second Peter 4, I'm sorry. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 4 verse 1, verse 8 and 16 to 18. In that order. Pay attention. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. Verse 8 and verses 16 and 18 in that order. Chapter 4, verse 1, verse 8 and verses 16 and 18. I charge thee, I command thee, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick, the living and the dead. Notice, Jesus Christ is our Lord, who is going to come to judge the living and the dead, at his appearing, when he appears, and his kingdom. So notice, it's Jesus who will appear in his kingdom. He will judge. He is the Lord. Okay, pay attention. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day, and not to me only, but unto all them 
also that love is appearing. So notice verse 8. The Lord is the righteous judge who will give believers a crown of righteousness at his appearing. If you go back to verse 1, that Lord is Jesus. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who is going to be appearing in his kingdom to judge and reward the living and the dead. So don't forget, in the context, it's talking about Jesus. If now I want you to watch how Paul ends this. Let's read 16 18. At my first answer, no man stood with me. When I had to go before the emperor, there was no Christian who stood alongside me. But all men forsook me. But uh, I pray God that he may not lay it to their charge. I pray God doesn't punish them for abandoning me. Now watch this though. Notwithstanding, even though they abandoned me, watch this. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me. Strengthen me. Oh, here goes Jesus strengthening believers again. He stood by my side. He didn't abandon me. He strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. Why was I delivered out of the mouth of the lion? I wasn't killed. Verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. This should blow you away. Notice in verse 18, he offers a doxology, which is an ascription of praise. To who? The Lord, who is going to preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To that Lord, be glory forever and ever. Amen. But who is that Lord? That Lord is the one who stood by me and strengthened me and delivered me and will preserve me. Who is he? Well, that's the Lord, who is the righteous judge, that will crown me with a crown of righteousness. At his appearing. Who is that? Verse 1. The Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Wow. Did you see what Paul just said? Again, it's Jesus who strengthens us. Strength comes from him. Jesus who preserves us. Preservation, endurance comes from him. Jesus stands by the side of all believers. And it is Jesus' kingdom and his appearance that we eagerly await. And he will judge us and the dead and crown us with righteousness if we belong to him. And that's why to Jesus belongs glory forever and ever. Amen. Wait, hold on, guys. You're telling me that Paul ascribed to Jesus the same accolades, the same praise, the same attributes, the same power that David did to Jehovah? David said riches come from Jehovah. Power comes from Jehovah. Strength, come, strength comes from Jehovah. Jehovah's name is to be glorified forever and ever, to be praised forever and ever. He is to be blessed forever and ever. And everything that David said, Paul said about Jesus. Strength comes from Jesus. Endurance comes from Jesus. Preservation comes from Jesus. Power comes from Jesus. Grace comes from Jesus. Riches comes from Jesus. He preserves me. He stands by me. He delivers me. And to him be glory forever and ever, ever and ever. And it's his kingdom. But wait, David said it's Jehovah's kingdom. To you, Jehovah, belongs the kingdom. Paul says it's Jesus's kingdom. It'll bring me into that kingdom. And it'll give me a crown of righteousness because he's going to judge the living and the dead and reward them. Could it be any clear, honestly, Rob, Batar, all of you, if you're listening, could it be any clear that Jesus is receiving the exact worship, accolades, praise that David gave to Jehovah? Could it be? You got it, Amariah. It's amazing, right? But wait, remember, David also said, Jehovah is the head of all the kingdoms of the earth. Everything in heaven and earth belongs to Jehovah, right? Because he's the king of heaven and earth, right? I don't know if Patar is listening, but that's all right. But let's see if Jesus is the head of everything. If Jesus is the king of heaven and earth and that everything in heaven and earth belongs to him. Matthew 28, 18. Oh, but it's going to get better. Wait. Matthew 28, 18. I guess we lost our brother, Fatar. You still here, bro? Fatar, are you on the guitar? Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Okay, I'm confused. David says, All power, everything in heaven and earth belongs to Jehovah. Jesus says it belongs to me. It's mine. It's mine. But wait, Jesus, didn't you read what David said? All power, all strength, 
all sovereignty, everything in heaven and earth, the kingdom of heaven and earth belongs to Jehovah. Yes. Yes. It's okay. We can muzzle him. Hopefully, enough not truth to turn away from this false prophet. Okay, you with me there? Is that clear? And yet it's described to you. Jesus says, all power, all authority in heaven and earth is mine. It's given to me. It's mine. Given to me. All right. Well done. Colossians 2, 9 to 10. Colossians 2, 9 to 10. Who's the head over all creation? Who's the head? David said Jehovah. David said Jehovah. All right. Let's see. For in him, the Lord Jesus, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead, the Adatas, that which makes God what he is, bodily. All the fullness of the divine essence resides in Jesus physically. So here it shows he's God and man. And ye are complete in him, which is the head. Notice who's the head. Christ is the head of all principality and power. But hold on. First Chronicles 29, 10-14 says, Jehovah's the head over everything. Paul says, Jesus is the head of all principality and power. It's not the only place he said it either. Now let's go to Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. Man, if this doesn't convince you, Jesus is Jehovah God Almighty in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit, and that these three are God, I don't know what will. Ephesians 1, 19 to 23. Again, what did the Father do when Christ humbled himself to die for us? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us, word, who believe? According to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought, which he demonstrated, which he displayed, which he used in Christ, when he raised him, Jesus, from the dead and set Jesus at his own right hand in the heavenly places. Now notice who Jesus is, right? Far above all principality. So Jesus is above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And it put all things under his feet. So everything's under the feet of Jesus. And gave him to be the head over all things to the church. Okay, now that really confuses me. Je Jehovah, according to David, is the head of all things. Here it says the father appointed the son to be head over everything for the sake of the church. The church being the body of Christ, the spiritual body, the fullness of Jesus filling, filling everything. So can you show me one thing that David ascribed to Jehovah that prays? That isn't ascribed to Jesus in the New Testament. Can you show me? Is there one thing that David said about Jehovah in the praise and worship of Jehovah in 1 Chronicles 29 that's not applied to Jesus here in the New Testament? Can you mention one? One thing that David glorified and praised Jehovah for that's not ascribed to Jesus? One thing? Light everyone else? One thing? No, right? Now, can you show me where that ascription is given to David or Solomon or anyone else in the Old Testament? Does anyone else receive that kind of accolades, that kind of praise beside Jehovah in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible? So why is Jesus receiving it? Explain to me, why is Jesus receiving the exact same praise, the exact same accolades that Jehovah is receiving from his subjects if jesus is a mere human being or an angelic creature that would be idolatry and the height of blasphemy if jesus is in god but we're not done yet let's go to revelation 1 5 to 6. and they want to convince me jesus is in god man am i convinced okay. and from jesus christ who's the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the, Lord, the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood so it's not about jesus and hath made us jesus made us so notice i have a kingdom because jesus gave me the kingdom made us kings and priests unto god and his father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen no but david said to jehovah is the dominion Jehovah is the glory. Jehovah is the power. Jehovah is the strength. Jehovah is to be blessed and praised forever and ever. And yet here in John, Jesus Christ our Lord, right, receives the glory and dominion and the praise forever and ever. Amen. And you want to convince me? You want to convince me Jesus is not Jehovah 
And Jesus is not worshipped as Jehovah's worship. But he's given the same honor that David is given. Come on, are you serious? You think Trinitarians have been stupid for 2,000 years? They don't know their Bible? So you come along, Paul Williams or Jehovah Witness, you come along to educate us on what the Bible now teaches? Okay. Very humble of you. Although we're not done yet. Let's go to Revelation 5, 8 to 12. Am I putting you guys to sleep? You bored yet? Revelation 5, 8 to 12. All right, now let's go to Revelation 5, 8 to 12. And by the way, can you let me know how much time I have on the live stream? How long has it been? And if the recording is good. Revelation 5, 8 to 12. Let's read. And when he had taken the book, Jesus Christ our Lord took the book. Watch what happens. The four beasts and four and 20, 20 elders, 24 elders, fell down before the Lamb. See, they fell down before him, the Lamb, which is Jesus. Having every one of them harps and golden vial, vials full of odors. Which are the prayers of saints. Now watch this, guys. What do the four living creatures, 24 elders do? They not only bow down to the Lamb. Watch that, what they say in 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy, you are worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. You are worthy, you the Lamb. Why? For thou wast slain. You were slain. Okay? And hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And has made us, all of us, unto our God. You made us a kingdom. You gave us a kingdom by what you did. And priest, and we shall reign on the earth. So you are worthy. Right? Now notice what all the myriads of angels say to the Lamb. In verses 11 and 12. Notice. Same thing that David said to Jehovah. And I beheld and heard the voice of many. Right? <clears throat> the voice of many. <clears throat> Angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousand of thousand. Now, side note, don't forget in verse 9, they're singing this praise to Jesus. They sung a new song. Now, now notice, they sing to Jesus. Sung a new song, saying, they sing. Not only do they pray, not only do they glorify, but they sing to Jesus Christ. And now notice, the angels, they will join the singing. Because notice 11, it says, myriads and myriads of angels. And verse 12, saying with a loud voice. Watch this, guys. The same thing that David said to Jehovah. Worthy is the lamb that was slain, slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. In case you missed it, let's see what David said to Jehovah in 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Do me a favor again. Find the truth. Post 1 Chronicles 29, 11. Back to back with Revelation 5, 12. But the best is yet to come, Emoram. I'm not done yet. The best is yet to come. Wait, wait. It gets better. First Chronicles 29, 11 with Revelation 5, 12. Watch. Thank our brother. Thine, O Lord, notice, David, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord Jehovah. And thou art exalted as head above all. Now compare what the angels say to the Lamb Jesus. Verse 12 of Revelation 5. Saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and best blessing. Now convince me Jesus is not being worshipped as Jehovah in the same way that David worshipped Jehovah. Convince me. Can you guys convince me? Light, can you convince me? Christian princess, can you convince me? Now, can I ask you a question? Find everyone else. How upsetting is this to see Paul Williams quote 1 Chronicles 29 20 and never bother mentioning verses 10 to 19 to show that the way David worships Jehovah is the exact same way Jesus is worshipped in the New Testament? Either he doesn't know the Bible and he's just reading books that quote verses out of context. Or he knows the Bible, but he's withholding this. Right? Oh, but wait. The best is yet to come. You guys want to see the best? We, I, I saved the best for last. 13 and 14. This is mind blowing. This one, forget it. It ends it. It's over after this. 13 and 14. Revelation 5, 13 and 14. I can end here and go on, but no, I'm going to look at other examples. To do a thorough job. Revelation 5, 13 and 14. And every creature, now notice John, 
goes out of his way that you get the point. Every creature that exists will eventually have to do this. He sees them doing it already, but that's a guarantee from God. John, the day will come when every creature in existence is going to do this willingly or unwillingly, whether they like it or not. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them. Wow, talk about exhausting the language. You'd think we'd get it when he said every creature, but he wants to make sure you got it. Look, guys, I'm talking about every creature that exists everywhere. There's a creature in heaven. He's included on earth, underneath the earth, such as are in the sea and all that are in them. Heard I saying, now watch this. Tell me this right here doesn't blow you away. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. Bam, end of story. The Lamb with God the Father on the throne receives the exact same blessing and honor and glory and power, not from some, not from most, but from every creature that exists everywhere. Every creature that possibly exists will exist. Every creature will give the Lamb the exact same honor Blessing, glory, and power that they give God the Father, and not for a short period, but forever and ever. And 14 says, and the four beasts said, Amen. Amen, meaning so be it, so shall it be. This is going to happen. Every creature is going to give Jesus and the Father this honor, glory, blessing, power forever, whether they like it or not. And the four and 24 elders fell down and worshiped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. Now, what else do you need? Two things you take away from this passage. Jesus is no mere creature. Though he became man to die, and though he's depicted as a lamb, by nature he's eternal and separate from creation. Why? Because every creature in existence is on one side, and Jesus is not joined to them, worshiping God. He's separated from them. He's on the same side that God is, and he's being worshipped by every creature in existence in the same way that God is worshipped. Do you need any more powerful proof that Jesus is no mere creature? But that he's eternal, uncreated, separate from every creature in existence. And secondly, this shows because he's no mere creature, because he's uncreated, he's eternal like God the Father is. He is worthy of the same worship, honor, glory, and majesty that the Father receives. Which is why the Father doesn't get angry, but commands that every creature honors the Son and gives the Son the same worship that he receives. Now, is this mind-blowing or what? I, I, It's complete silence now. How do you refute this? Is this mind-blowing? And could you find a more stronger proof that Christ is uncreated, eternal, worthy of the same majesty and glory that the Father is worthy of, which is why every creature must worship him the same way they worship the Father forever? Now, Light, you've heard this before, but hearing it again, what does this do for you? And for those of you who are hearing it again, Pitar, I don't know what happened to poor Pitar. Yep, the Bible's corrupt, exactly what he's going to tell you. Oh, who know, Who wrote Revelation? We don't know who. Interesting. Now, could it be any clearer that Christ is uncreated, eternal, worthy of the same divine majesty that the Father, the Father receives? And the Jehovah Witness Bible reads just as clear, if not more clearly. So now, have I proven that the way David worshipped Jehovah is the exact same way Jesus is worshipped in the New Testament? Right. But are you, you heard all this, right? So you heard the entire session? Glory to God. Because you're one of the regulars that I like to bless, that the Lord used me to bless you. So now, when someone quotes you 1 Chronicles 29, 20, to show, see, David is worshipped. Doesn't mean he's God. So what Jesus is worshipped? You know that person doesn't know the Bible, right? Or if he knows, he's being deceptive and wicked. Now, Light, what does it say about the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society? An organization that claims to be the anointed class through whom God speaks. What does it say when they know these passages because they've translated the Bible? What does it say about them hiding this information from the congregation? What does it tell you about them? And you see the damage it's done for loved ones in your life. I don't want to mention it by name. But you see, because there's a loved one in your life who's been damaged, deceived by them, so that he cannot see that Jesus is Jehovah God. Right? 
But light, he that is in you is greater than he is the world. Just keep praying and loving, and he'll get saved like you did. In God's time, look how many years it took you. Right? Well, you're going to give it to him. You're going to study it and give it to him. You're going to share it with him slowly and lovingly as you pray. Right? That's one reason why you see the enemy wants to keep us away from teaching, especially on Pelotar. You see it, right? Why do you think the attacks are vicious? Where people get discouraged, like Christian friends, right? James I will never show his face on Peltoc, right? You see why, right? Because this is dangerous stuff. It destroys the kingdom of darkness for the glory of Jesus. And if Satan has his way, he'll stop us from putting it in the hands of people. So Christ is worshipped to the same extent, to the same degree that the Father is, because Christ is not a mere creature. He became flesh, he became part of creation, but by nature he's eternal. And praise his holy name. He's almighty. Now let me give you other places you know ed van halen can i be honest with you brother i don't blame him because there are people who comment on on some of the videos that drive me nuts where i get so angry i have to ask god to save me from my anger because of some of the foolish arguments man so in one way i can't blame him because you don't want a platform for people to spread their ignorance their heresy their blasphemy their stupidity right do you want i don't want that now, can you guys vouch for fighting brainless and nervous? Right? You know, fighting brainless is kosher, right, if I remember? See, his name always throw, throws me off, fighting brainless. But now I understand what it means. He's fighting people who are brainless. Is nervous wreck kosher? Nervous wreck, I think you are. I'm going to take a chance. Anyway, there's more to the worship of the Lord. Let me show you other examples of Jesus being worshipped in the way that only God can be worshipped. Are you ready? I'm excited for you guys. Acts, well, before we go to Acts. Psalm 31.5. Psalm 31, verse 5. And we'll do an hour on this one, and I'll do another one. I'll do another one. We'll do three today, okay, God willing? And then, Lord willing, I'll be free Wednesday to do a couple more. God willing, if not Tuesday night. Psalm 31, verse 5. Let's continue with the worship that Jesus receives. Notice how the psalmist prays to Jehovah Yahweh. Psalm 31, verse 5. Into thine hand I commit my spirit. Thou hast redeemed me, O Jehovah, God of truth. God of truth means... The God who is true. The God who is truth. Okay? So into whose hands does he commit a spirit? Into who, whose hands does he entrust his life? Jehovah, the God who is truth. Right? Now, can any creature ever pray to someone other than God in heaven and say to someone other than God in heaven, Oh, so-and-so, into your hands I commit my spirit. I entrust my life to your care and protection. Absolutely not. That would be idolatry and blasphemy. Okay? Now, why would I entrust my spirit to God? Ecclesiastes 12.7 tells me. Ecclesiastes 12.7 tells me. Watch here. Ecclesiastes 12.7. Ecclesiastes 12.7. Then shall the dust return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Unto God who gave it. So you see why I entrust my spirit to God? He gave me the spirit, it'll go back to him. Right? He gave me the spirit, it'll go back to him, right? So why do you trust your spirit to God? Why do you pray to God to try, to take care of your spirit and to take your spirit, especially at death? Because it comes from him. Okay, now watch how the Lord prays. Luke 23, 46. Notice how Jesus prayed while he's on earth. The perfect man, being the perfect worshiper, Showing mankind what God expects of humanity. He becomes the man that God wants all men and women to be. Luke 23, 46. Notice Jesus on the cross. And when Jesus had cried out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said thus, he gave up the ghost. Now that makes sense because the Father is God. And the spirits come from the Father. So Jesus, upon death, entrusts his spirit to the Father. And then gives up his spirit, his ghost, and dies physically. And now, explain to me, Stephen, a Jewish monotheist, well versed in the scriptures, Acts 6 and 7 say, filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Ghost and power, who knows his Bible well, as he's being killed, and he's, as he's about to die, explain to me why he prays the way he does. Acts 7, 59 and 60. Acts 7, 59 and 60. Watch here. The first martyr, the first one who died for Jesus because he's worthy. 
I pray we will live for him and if necessary, die for him. Watch this light and everyone else. Acts 7, 59 and 60. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God, saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Who received my spirit? Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Acts 7, 59 and 60. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Wow. You know who your God is at the moment of death. Because at death, you forget everyone. And you remember the God who created you. And he is the one you call when you face death. And yet here, as Stephen faces death, the God that he calls is Jesus. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he says to Jesus, Lord, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. So he asked Jesus two things. Lord Jesus, take my spirit into your presence, about to die for you and you're worthy, showing that Jesus is the God who gives us our spirits with the Father and the Holy Spirit. And then he asked the Lord Jesus, Lord, don't condemn them for what they just did. Don't hold this sin against them, this sin of murdering me, right? Yeah, but the problem with Van Halen, the way he can't use that because he fell asleep because the spirit left. So the body went to sleep and went prone, but where did the spirit go? So that actually backfires against them, right? Right, Ed Van Halen? What went to sleep? The body after the spirit left. That's why the body, quote unquote, sleeps, because the spirit left. Okay? Like, did you see that prayer? A beautiful prayer showing that the first Christians were Jews. They were Jews. Worship Jesus as Jehovah. Man, this Bible is amazing. Wow, is this a sure word from God. Showing us that Christ is real. And we can trust that he's alive. And when death comes upon us, guess who's going to be there to receive our spirits? Our blessed, beautiful Savior, Jesus. Praise his holy name. That same Jesus who stood up to receive the spirit of Stephen will be there to receive our spirits as we're covered by his blood. In fact, let me show you how humble and amazing and loving Jesus is. Acts 7, 55, 56. A few more examples of Jesus being worshipped as God. Acts 7, 55 to 56. Watch this. But he being full of the Holy Ghost. Now notice who's moving Stephen to have a vision of Christ in heaven and to worship Christ, the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Watch this. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open. So the dimension of heaven opened up because it's time for him to die. And that's what happens. You'll hear a lot of bedside stories. When people are about to die, heaven opens up and they see either loved ones to greet them or they see angels or they see Jesus himself. This happens a lot. And notice. If you're in the room with them, they're looking at the ceiling. You're seeing a ceiling. They're seeing heaven open, just like here in 56. And said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, Gloria, I'm going to have you share that testimony in a minute because reality proves the Bible is true. Death is not final. But guys, pay attention. Everyone, light, pay attention. Notice that he says, Behold, I see the heavens open, heaven opened up for him by the Holy Spirit, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Jesus is depicted as seated at God's right hand. But when Stephen sees him, he's standing. Do you know why? You guys know this because I've shared it in the past. But light, I hope this moves you in your spirit. It moves every one of us in the spirit. Jesus was standing in honor of his servant in order to welcome him into his presence and embrace him. The King of glory humble stood up for his servant he stood up for his servant you see how beautiful jesus is you see how beautiful he is how infinitely beautiful is he is a, a maggot a worm from the dust stephen like all of us and the lord jesus stands up basically telling stephen Welcome home, son. Come home. Come to me. I'm here to embrace you. Don't be afraid. And it's after that they start stoning him. You see how he comforts him? He first appears to him so that he'd be comforted from the pain of the stones. 
So here's the eternal son of God standing up. The king. Can you imagine you go to a king and in your presence he stands up to embrace you and kiss you? That's what King Jesus, the king of kings and lord of lords, Muhammad's God and judge did. He stood up for his servant Stephen. Praise his only name. Lord, please have mercy on us. And Lord, be so real in our lives. I have no doubt that you're real. Yeah, Allah. Right? The Lord Jesus saved them too in Jesus' name. Is he amazing or what? Yes, you better believe it, light. This will move you to tears. Because Jesus is real, sister. More real than you can imagine. And he will heal us. We're broken now, sister. We're hurt. We're damaged. Right? I got so many issues. But my king, your king, King Jesus, is alive. And he's taking our broken pieces and restoring them to turn us into that beautiful masterpiece that he designed us to be. Conform to his image, right? God bless you, dude. Take care, right? So, here you go, King Jesus. Now, let me show you one more point, real quickly, related to this. Let's read Acts seven sixty to eight verse one. I'm gonna put a song before we do the third section. Acts seven sixty and eight one. Notice. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Now notice chapter 8, verse 1. Who was there? And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now, did you catch it? Why do you think Luke mentioned Saul? Because Luke is trying to show you it was because of Stephen's prayer that Jesus honored and saved Saul to replace Stephen. So notice how powerful your prayer, prayers are if you delight the art of Jesus. Jesus takes your prayers to heart. And when you pray and you're pleasing to him, he acts upon your prayers in love and mercy. Because Stephen prayed, Jesus then had his eyes on Saul. And what's amazing, if you read Acts 6 and 7, you'll see that Stephen was a man of holiness filled with the Spirit and mighty in Scripture. He knew the Old Testament inside and out, just like Saul did. So here you see Saul replacing Stephen, was just as mighty as him, and Saul being saved because of the intercession of Stephen. MRM, you got to keep praying that God keeps filling me afresh with knowledge and information. Because everything good is from him. Do you see it? So this should encourage you. Your prayers are not in vain. If you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ, walking in love with him by the Spirit, he loves your prayers. He loves to hear from you and will honor your prayers to show his love for you. All right? Is this beautiful or what? Now, let me show you one final example of Jesus being prayed to. Well, two more. Two more, and we'll do a third session. And then, Glory, maybe you can take the mic and tell us about your loved one. We can do it off the session, or you can do it on the session. It's up to you. But here, John 14, 12 to 14. Okay, don't worry. Then what I'll do is I'll just, you know, have you text it in. Because you know how you are. You're afraid of the mic. You're afraid of attention. You're afraid of people. I'm scared, Sam. Sam, can you protect me? All right. John 14, 12 to 14. Let's read. John 14, 12 to 14. I think Notorious is kosher. I get him confused with others. Let's see. Read with me, Light and everyone else. John 14, 12 to 14. Verily, verily, I send to you. Look what our Lord says. He that believeth on me, Jesus speaking, the works that I do shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. Notice Jesus says, look, you're going to be doing the same works I've been doing, but a greater number of them. Why? Because I go to my Father. Well, you've heard me mention this, and I'll mention it again. Notice it's Jesus going to the Father that results in the disciples doing a greater number of works that Jesus had been doing on earth. Well, why is that? Because of 13 and 14. Pay attention here. Jesus is the hearer of prayer. Whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do. That's why you're going to do greater works than, than, than me. Because when I go to the Father, you will ask. And when you ask in my name, I'll be doing the works for you and through you. By the Spirit, obviously, in union with the Father and Spirit. That the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Wow. Jesus is saying, when I go to the Father, from that moment on, you can ask for anything. I'll do it when you ask in my name through you. 
so that the result will be you'll be doing greater works than I did while I was on earth. So Jesus is claiming to be the hearer of prayer. Now, can you show me anywhere in the Old Testament where David or Solomon or Moses or any of them said, look, when I die and I go to heaven, you can then ask me from heaven in my name and I will then do it for you from heaven. Right? Did any of the prophets or even angels say, ask in my name, I will do it for you personally from heaven? Any of the prophets? Any of the apostles? But Jesus says, when I go to heaven, ask in my name, I will do it. Now, my question for every one of you is, what kind of attributes must Jesus have to be able to know who's praying to him, how many are praying, where they are praying, what they're praying for, and then have the ability to answer all their prayers accordingly and perfectly? He must be omnipotent. He has to be powerful enough to answer all these prayers because the things they'll be doing, they'll be raising the dead, healing the sick, casting out demons, giving sight to the blind, which is a power that only God possesses. And he's going to be doing it through all of them. So no matter where they're at, if Peter is in Jerusalem and Paul is in Rome and Thomas is in India, they can pray at the same time and he's going to answer them simultaneously. Right? It's not only the spirit with them. He's seeing them, sustaining them in union with the Father and the Spirit. And he has to be omniscient and omnipresent. So here you have Jesus being prayed to. He's the object of prayer. And Jesus being the 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 one answering prayer prayer, because unlike David, he's no mere man. He's fully God who became flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. And you want to convince me that First Chronicles 29 20 is teaching that David was worshipped like Jesus is worshipped, because neither David nor Jesus are God. They're simply being honored as kings of Israel. Yeah, right, buddy. Yeah, right. Psalm 65, 2. Let's see who is the hearer of prayer. And then one more example of Jesus being prayed to. And then we're going to end this session and take a 15-minute break, Lord willing. And I'm going to do a third session if you're up for it. If you're not tired, since the rapture hasn't happened yet, I can do a third session. Psalm 65, 2. Notice what David says about Jehovah. O thou, Jehovah, O thou that hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Wait. The one who hears prayer is Jehovah. O thou who hearest prayer. But Jesus says, ask him when I, my name. I will do it because I'm the one who will hear your prayers. Jesus, who do you think you are? God in the flesh, one with the Father and the Spirit. Got a problem with it? Absolutely not. I worship, I love, I adore you, Lord Jesus. Now, since we're in the Psalm, Psalm 99, 5-7. Psalm 99, 5-7. Exalt ye the Lord our God, Jehovah our God, and worship at his footstool, for he is holy. Now notice this. Moses and Aaron among his priests, and Samuel among them that call upon his name. I want you to remember that. Call upon his name. Don't forget that. Call upon the name of Jehovah. Call upon his name. That's found all throughout the Old Testament, right? They called upon the Lord. Not Moses, not Michael, not Gabriel. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. He spake unto them in a cloudy pillar. They kept his testimonies in the ordinance that he gave them. Psalm 116, 104. Psalm 116, 104. I'm going to have to take a 15 minute break after this. Psalm 116, 104. Watch this. I really hope this is blessing you. The Lord Jesus is anointing the sound of my voice to be pleasing to you. Psalm 116, 104. For the glory of Christ. I love the Lord. Amen. We love you, Lord. We love you, Yahweh. We love you, Jehovah. We love you, Father, Son, and Spirit. We love you. I love you, Lord. I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. Because I love him, because he first loved me, I won't stop calling on him, meaning praying to him, singing to him, praising him, invoking him as long as I live. And in Jesus' name, may we never stop. But the Lord takes us home. Now watch this. Verse 3. The sorrows of death compassed me. And the pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then called I upon the name of the Lord. O Lord Jehovah, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. So he delivers me from death, from disease, from calamities, from hell. He delivers me from all of it. Now 13 and 17. Psalm 116, 13 and 17.
I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord Jehovah. Notice again, call on the name of Jehovah. I will take his salvation. I'll drink it. I'll receive his salvation. Lord Jesus, I receive you as my Savior. I, I receive your salvation. I will offer to thee the sacrifice of thanksgiving. And I will call upon the name of the Lord, Jehovah. Okay, did you guys catch it? You will not find a single exception in the entire Old Testament where God allows his faithful to call on the name of someone other than him. You can only call on the name of the, the Lord Jehovah for salvation, for healing, for your needs, for praise and thanksgiving. Only him, right? Only him. But then 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. Watch here. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, set apart and united to Christ Jesus. All of us in Jesus' name, I pray we're united to him. Called to be saints, holy ones. With all, pay attention, with all that in every place, everywhere there are Christians, they're known for this. They're characterized by this practice. In every place, call upon the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. Wow. Christians everywhere were known for calling upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Something we just read in the Old Testament is to be done in reference to Jehovah. You are to call on the name of Jehovah, and yet Paul and the first Christians, the Jewish Christians, and the Gentiles who believe through their message, all of them called on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, can you show me where anyone called on the name of David? Anyone called on the name of Solomon? Anyone called on the name of Gabriel? You can't, and yet you're trying to convince me Jesus was only worshipped in the sense of being honored and reverenced. Like David was, but wasn't worshipped as God. I'm convinced. How about you? You convinced? This session is over, folks. It's done. All glory to the sovereign triumph God, Father, Son, Spirit. I pray I made no errors. If I did, may correct those errors. I don't repeat them and save you from them. And strengthen us in what we heard and fill us with love and power and joy from the Spirit. To walk in these truths and proclaim them for the glory of Jesus. May increase in us. May cover us, my wife and daughters, under the precious blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the Son of God, our Lord. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus, we love you. Amen, amen. I got another session I'm going to do, if you guys are interested.